Hello again, my name is Marty Braden, and if you're new to my channel, let me just take a moment and bring you up to speed. I wrote a book called An Atheist Delusion. It's my response as a Latter-day Saint to Richard Dawkins' anti-theist, anti-Christ book, The God Delusion. As you know, he's a renowned atheist, and he's an evolutionary biologist as well. And in my last video, part 29, I introduced chapter 2 of my book, An Atheist Delusion. And Richard's book has that exact same title in his book chapter two. It's titled The God Hypothesis. Now you might be saying, where's your shirt? If you've seen other videos, where's your white tie? Where's your white shirt and your ties? And I, I decided to let you know I'm not just a stiff Latter-day Saint. I have fun in me and I, I, I relax here and there. And so I thought I'd go ahead on this Saturday afternoon and wear my casual shirt and go ahead and share part 30. Last time part was uh, part 29 and today is part 30. I'm going to introduce uh, chapter 2's new title here, a subtitle, in just a moment. So let's go ahead and continue on where I left off last time. It's right here. Richard says, quote, Religious historians, atheist ones at least, say that there was a progression from primitive tribal animisms, that's attributing a soul to plants and inanimate objects, on through polytheisms, the belief in multiple deities, such as those of the Greeks, Romans, and Norsemen, on to monotheisms. Judaism and its derivatives, Christianity and Islam, are the big three religions of our day, and they are such monotheisms. End of his quote. Richard summarizes his criticisms about all the religions that have, in his mind, risen up over the millenniums of years past when he says, quote, they're just different manifestations or incarnations of the one God, end quote. This idea that God's derived from one original God is exactly right. The God that everything had flowed and came through apostasy and so forth, the reason was Jehovah, Jehovah of the Old Testament. Richard then takes his readers back through the millenniums by giving a history lesson on the religious uh, various iterations and their infighting and their outfighting. He ends this history lesson by saying, quote, such has ever been the way of theology, end quote. A little bit of bias there. As I just said, in some ways, Richard is right with his descriptions here. Apostate theology does have a way of manifesting all that Richard hates about religion. But as far as religion coming from evolution, um, if it is simply Richard's unproven opinion and theory, of course. These so-called iterations of religion and its gods, Richard believes, are the result of some type of deterministic natural selection iterations caused by active protons <laughs> bouncing against the walls of multiple parental ancestors' wet brains, creating unguided, undirected, unintended, mindless, delusional concepts about a sky god. God, It's ridiculous in reality, in my mind. It's just Richard's overly educated imagination at work here, which I describe as delusional. Evolutionary religion is Richard's personal, unproven, untested theory. It isn't a scientifically tested, irrefutable fact. It's just one man's incredibly creative, yet delusional theory, and to this theory, Richard hasn't, at least not so far as I'm concerned, he's not added one iota of evidence in support of his belief that God does not exist, at least so far what we've covered. The first subtitle for chapter two, Richard called polytheism. So let's get into that. Polytheism. Dawkins, being a quasi-disciple of Charles Darwin, claims that the evolutionary process is the power behind the crane of natural selection and behind the arrival of all world religions and their espoused beliefs, end quote. And it is Richard's second consciousness racer. In this chapter's subtitle, Richard begins with this statement. It is not clear why the change from polytheism to monotheism should be assumed to be a self-evident progressive improvement a process much like the theory of evolution being applied to biology's mutations, taking animal species towards better states through the process of natural selection, etc., etc. But it widely is, end quote. Once again, it is merely Richard's conjectured opinion that this is what supposedly took place. Richard gives no incontrovertible tested evidence that can be used to predict this process going forward or test it following today's scientific methods. And that's because, as you know, it would take millions and millions of years to prove out any such interpretive predictions or opinions by performing the necessary repeated testing in order to confirm his theory that religion evolved like man evolved through millions of iterations. 
How convenient is that? The time needed to test it virtually eliminates our ability to prove or falsify this ridiculous theory. But again, Richard postulating this theory doesn't add one scintilla of evidence to help support his argument for God's non-existence. Next, Richard quotes to Mr. Ivan Warwick, who said, quote, Monotheism, in its turn, is doomed to subtract one more God and become atheism. <laughs> A nice one to quote. Richard considers the attack on polytheism, polytheism being the belief in or worship of plurality of gods, particularly those faced in the Middle East, by Christian religionists to be a snobbish discrimination against polytheism. Richard's goal here is to abandon religion altogether and its charitable status because he feels church preachers avoid paying taxes on contributions made by their congregants. Richard uses Oral Roberts as just one of many examples to describe what he says is, quote, a charade, its proponents being obscene, well-heeled, super hairdo, bouffant hairdo, televangelists, <laughs> end quote. Richard says polytheistic faiths are actually just different manifestations or incarnations of the one God idea, each just having a different name, such as Lord Brahm, the creator, or Lord Vishnu, the preserver, or Lord Shiva, the destroyer, and so on, end quote. Richard then discusses the Aryan heresy, saying, rivers of medieval ink, not to mention blood, have been squandered over the mystery of the Trinity. With, which shows its ridiculousness, end quote. In fact, he says, quote, this was a splitting of hairs that split Christendom in two, and such civil war in the church has been the way of theology, once again, quote. Richard then goes into a critique of the confusion that thrives among Christians regarding the Trinity's many descriptions. Here's what he says about Christians' triune God, quote, do we have one God in this in three parts or three gods in one? What is it? Unlike science or most other branches of human scholarship, Christendom has not moved one inch in 18 centuries. <laughs> Richard then quotes Thomas Jefferson, who Richard says was a deist. Thomas and other founding fathers subscribe to the liberal religion strand of deism that values reason over revelation. It, meaning deism, also rejects traditional Christian doctrines, including the virgin birth, original sin, and the resurrection of Jesus, end quote. Richard then says, Jefferson said, and I quote, ridicule is the only weapon which can be used against unintelligible propositions, end quote. Ideas must be distinct ideas before reason can act upon them, Richard says, and no man ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity. It is merely abracadabra of the Montebanks. A mountebank being a charlatan, someone who tricks people out of their money, calling themselves the priests of Jesus, end quote. These quotes are examples from people who Richard feels are respectable. He uses them as allies to support his criticism of religious faith and its doctrines altogether. Of course, there are thousands of people who have Richard's same opinion of religion, but that in and of itself does not prove God's non-existence any more than my putting forth the billions of people who say atheism is anti-Christ and therefore it is proof that God exists. It is an interesting sidebar for sure, but it doesn't add one iota of support to this debate regarding God's existence or non-existence. Richard goes on to say, quote, The other thing I cannot help remarking upon is the overweening confidence with which the religious uh, assert minute details for which they have neither any kind of evidence, nor could they have. End quote. This certainly is just one more overstated, hyperbolic opinion given by Richard. Richard continues his relentless attack on religion when he says, quote, The Catholic faith is a polytheological conundrum, with all the many saints and the many iterations of the Mother of Jesus, all of which are worshipped as many gods. End quote. I suppose this is why he took the time to write about it so critically. He feels this is all falls into the polytheism category due to its many saints, which are treated as gods, the Virgin Mary being another redeemer as her son, Jesus Christ is, as Catholics believe she is. Richard says, quote, who cares? Life is too short to bother with the distinction between one figment of the imagination and many. I shall refer to all deities whether poly or monotheistic, as simply God. It's all full of the richness of human gullibility, end quote. 
Richard certainly has a way of words. I'm telling you what, he has some great wordsmithing. Anyhow, he makes me chuckle. Richard ends the chapter and its two subtitles by saying, quote, I am not attacking any particular version of God or gods, although he does feel most strongly about the God of the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And a fourth, if you count Mormonism, which he comments on a little later in this book. I'm attacking God, he says, all gods, anything and everything supernatural, whatever and whenever they have been or will be invented, end quote. In response to Richard's re rejection of all religion on its face and of its many gods and of many who has a similar take on the theism and religion with their sky god controlling them, I would simply say that Richard is fulfilling prophecy given by many of God's servants, the prophets, even the prophets living in our day, all of whom have declared that we are living in an age of apostasy, a day when we shall see the fruit of apostasy within the religions of the world. These religious truths of apostasy are the way of apostasy. And so in one sense, I agree with Richard when he talks about the well-heeled super hairdo televangelists. They are examples of wolves in sheep's clothing, preachers of preachcraft. Priestcraft being when men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain and the praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of the church and kingdom of God. You can do a search at Church of Jesus Christ Dot org, type in priestcraft for a full and more robust review of this practice that we call priestcraft. Like Mr. Dawkins felt comfortably uh, to uh, doing with his arguments, I will reference individuals who I consider to be voices of reason and of authority, even though these voices will be considered unqualified by Richard and others that are non-believing pseudo-intellectuals like him. And that's because my sources speak positively about religion. And because they do, Richard rejects them out of hand. The chief voices of reason for me are the voices of prophets from the Bible. Prophets who lived in ancient America, whom we learn about from the Book of Mormon and their ancient records translated by the prophet Joseph Smith, Jr. in 1829, as well as the voices of living prophets walking amongst us today. These are the prophets, seers, and revelators that lead the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints today, the church that has was and was restored in the early 19th century. They live and serve amongst us traveling throughout the world, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with all those who will listen to a prophet's voice. Joseph Smith the prophet was commanded of God to give warning to the people of our day. And having done so, he was harassed, beaten, tarred and feathered, wrongfully taken to court more than 200 times, and ultimately shot and killed by a state-sanctioned mob, along with his older brother Hiram. Just like the prophets of old were martyred for their testimonies of Jesus' divinity. Jesus himself was killed by the wicked religionists of his day, fearing their priestcraft would be found out and rejected by their followers, so they killed him. These wicked false teachers, fearing to do it themselves, however, sought the power of Rome and its guards to perform the cruelty of crucifixion to exterminate their nemesis, Jesus of Nazareth, to death. Here's just a few examples of the Lord's prophets giving prophetic warnings about atheists and their anti-Christ message. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 4, Apostle Paul says, For the time will come when they, the peoples of the world, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. These verses describe those individuals who seek out messages and doctrines that condone their worldly lifestyle, as opposed to seeking out the teachings of Jesus and his prophets and obeying their commandments. The prophet Joseph, uh, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 5 verse 21 says, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. The prophet Nephi from the Book of Mormon declared in 2 Nephi 9 verse 29, all oh, that cunning plan of the evil one, all oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men. When they are learned, so-called eminently intelligent, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsels of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves, in other words, of science and reason alone. Therefore, 
Their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. The prophet Joseph Smith, Jr. received and recorded this revelation that says in Doctrine and Covenants 1, verse 16, They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, meaning having no real substance, in other words, just made of wood or the arm of the flesh, etc., which waxeth old, and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great. That's a type and shadow of the world, Babylon, which shall fall. Now that's what I call a straightforward understanding of where I stand regarding this topic of religion and how Richard seems to despise any and all forms of it. And whether you agree with me or not, at least you know now what my perspective is on this topic of religion being, quote, the result of evolution. Let's go on to the next subtitle where Richard addresses monotheism. All right, make some comments, ask your questions. I look forward to reading some of them and doing my best to answer what I can with the time I've got. But until then, uh, when we pick it up on this monotheism, I want to wish you continued success. Goodbye.